The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. This week, as the Freeze Art Fairs open and international collectors descend on London, I talk about Mark Rothko with the painter's son Christopher, we find out what galleries are doing about the climate emergency, and we hear about Nicolas Poussin and dance. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and I'm standing in Regent's Park in London, not far from the Freeze London tent. As a show of works on paper by Mark Rothko opens at Pacey's New Gallery in London's West End, I talked to Christopher Rothko about the show and about his father's love for the art of J.M.W. Turner, among much else. Later, Louisa Buck talks to Heath Lowndes of the Gallery Climate Coalition about galleries' attempts to address the climate crisis. And in this week's Work of the Week, as a beautiful new show of the work of Poussin opens at the National Gallery here in London, I talk to Francesca Whitlam-Cooper, the curator of the exhibition, about the French artist's obsession with the Borghese dancers, an ancient Roman bas-relief now in the Louvre and on loan to that exhibition, and how he used it in his painting. Before all that, why not subscribe to the art newspaper? You can currently make a big saving on the quarterly price of our complete subscription. That's the printed newspaper delivered to your door and full access to the digital content on the website and our apps for iOS and Android. Subscribe today to get the offer of £22 or $29.25 per quarter. Go to theartnewspaper.com and click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page for this and our full range of subscriptions. Now, the Pace Gallery opened a new space in Mayfair in London last week, and in its opening programme is an exhibition dedicated to a group of works on paper made by Mark Rothko in 1968, the first exhibition in the UK to focus solely on Rothko's paintings on paper. I went to Pace and spoke to Rothko's son Christopher about the show, the situation in his father's life at the time, and the artist's remarkable gift of nine of his Seagram murals to the Tate Gallery, which was being negotiated at the time. Those works are now on display at Tate Britain. Christopher, the first thing that hit me when I walked into this exhibition was that the works are on a scale which is smaller than perhaps many of us are used to with your father's work in the sense that they tend to be of an enveloping scale. These are almost like easel scale. So tell us about these pictures. How do they differ from those larger works? So these paintings are, they're the result of... uh, necessity becoming a virtue. Uh, My father had a very serious illness, very serious heart condition uh, starting in 1968 and he was uh, forced for a while to paint only on paper and on a very small scale Uh, and he proceeded rather than letting this uh, pull him down, he proceeded to produce more work in the next two years than he did at any other point in his life. Had three easel boards where he would work on three paintings at, at once Um, and these smaller scale works allowed him to create works that were meaningful and impactful to be viewed, I think, at a little bit closer range and still be enveloping emotionally, even if they could not fill your whole field of vision. And then, and then as time went on, he, he increased uh, the scale and eventually started painting to some degree on canvas again, but always kept with paper through the end of his life. One of the things that's so interesting about your father's work is that he definitely had ideas of how he wanted the viewer to behave in front of the works in terms of the distance from the work, in terms of the way the, the, the lighting uh, was set, all that kind of thing. He was, he was very clear about the conditions for seeing them, wasn't he? Extremely clear and and passionate about it. Uh, Above all things, he wanted to make sure that his paintings didn't become simply decorative. They did not become wallpaper. Very easy for a Rothko to become wallpaper. So he was always encouraging the viewer to spend more time, to look more deeply. It's part of the reason for the dark tone of the last 13 or so years of uh, of his career. He no longer was so concerned to get every viewer to stop. Instead, he wanted to make sure who every viewer who did stop had a longer, sort of more slowly engaging uh, type of relationship, really a long conversation. And so he, those colors, starting with actually the Seagram works, the works that we know so well from the Tate Gallery, with those works where he knew you were going to be sitting with him for a long time, he starts painting in a color tone, color palette that will allow the works to slowly uh, envelop you, slowly get into your system and for you to have a more extended conversation. One of the things about the color that's often, there's, there's almost a myth around your father's use of color towards the end of his career, right? So it, it progresses into ever greater monochrome and to darkness and that somehow is symptomatic of, of the mental illness that ultimately led to his death. That's one of the things that I notice about this show is an absolute 
counterpoint. There's so much bright colour as well as darkness in these paintings. Uh, yes, it is a myth that my father just descends into darkness and then uh, takes his own life. Uh, there's no question that he was battling a depression, a terrible depression the last few years of his life, and terrible illness. It would have, would have killed him actually quite shortly afterwards, and yet it, it doesn't stop him. As I said, these last couple of years, he's painting passionately and incredibly actively, and rather than succumbing to this, he paints his way through it. But indeed, there are very bright colored paintings, and there are paintings that are very dark at first appearance, and then there's always uh, some lightness that, that creeps through. And I think all through his career, he's, he's acknowledging that we're never simply happy or sad, that, that sadness is much more poignant because of all the, the wonderful, joyous things that we remember that we gave up, and that joy is always has an admixture of sadness. All, all the difficulty we came through to get to that joyous point, and in fact, how much, how much more dramatic the, uh, the joy is, in fact, because you've had to suffer to get there. And in fact, didn't he actually say that for all the darkness, there had to be a glimmer of hope in every work? And essentially, even if he was painting the most tumultuous elements of the human drama, there had to be a light that fundamentally was omitted from the work. Uh, absolutely, and you'll, and you'll see that in paintings here that are 90% black, and there's just a little stripe of color, and somehow it's not a dark painting. There's always that admixture. I love this characterization that your father gave to the work, which is that they were novels rather than the dramas that were the bigger pictures. Can you say what you think he might have meant by that? Uh, yes, he read Nietzsche very closely, Birth of Tragedy, that was a huge influence for him, and uh, he looked at the Greeks very carefully and, and painting of the Renaissance, and he was always interested in uh, the dramatic element of painting and how drama sort of recreated that, uh, that uh, elemental uh, aspect of, of life. And he always wanted to engage his, his, uh, his viewers in that sense of drama in his paintings. With these works, which he recognized could not be on the same scale, at least initially to what, uh, to what people were used to with his work, he, he understood that you could no longer be in the drama in the same way, and yet he could still engage you as a very active reader. He could, he could make something that would unfold and be rich and multi-layered, and you could be in it, maybe not quite the same level of participation, and, and yet, uh, my, my, again, my line about this is you have to be an active reader in order to get something from, from these works, and that's, that's always true with Rothko. Absolutely. One of the things I'm always curious about is to what extent he was looking to the art of the past right to the end. So these are some of the final paintings he made the last two years of his life, essentially. To what extent was he also always looking back? Because he was a master in his own right by that stage, but was he continually engaging with art history at that time? Uh, he, he maintained to the end that he was not a revolutionary, that he saw his work as sort of a natural evolution uh, in the history of art, and he, rather than feeling like he had made a break, he was very proud to be someone who was stepped forward from painters of the Renaissance, from uh, Rembrandt, who he worshipped and who, of course, could find so much lightness, just a little glimmer in the eye of an otherwise black and brown painting. Or through uh, Matisse, who, uh, again, we think of him with very bright colors, and yet there is, uh, there is sorrow mixed in with, uh, with the beauty of Matisse. Uh, yes, so he continues to look at great art from the past through his life. I, I, my first trip that I remember is in 1966. We spent the entire summer in Rome, and I promise you he spent every day in churches and in galleries looking at the great art of the past. You mentioned Matisse there, and of course there are parallels between those late great cutouts of Matisse where he, where he refined his sense of colour and form so precisely. And there are ov obvious parallels between your father's late work and, and Matisse's, aren't there? Yes, and, and another artist who creates an important chapel space in the end of his life, and another artist who, despite physical disability uh, toward the end of his life, you know, uh, passionately and, and just doggedly creates work up until the very last moment. You you mentioned the Seagram Mules, we're in London, and those pictures are, you know, beloved pictures here in London. They are, they are icons of one of our great cultural institutions at the Tate. One of the interesting things is, of course, that they travelled to Tate Modern. They were initially meant for the Tate Gallery. There was no thought of a Tate Modern at that stage when they arrived in uh, 1970. They then moved, they crossed the river when we had a Museum of Modern Art in this country, but they left a fundamental element behind, which was the association with 
JMW Turner. They're back at Tate Britain now in Turner's company. Tell me something about that. How does it feel for you to see them again in that in, in that context? Well, I, I'm actually I'm going to see them today this afternoon. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Uh, both to see them in the context of the Turners, who he, he loved Turner. I think he once quipped that uh, that chap Turner learned uh, learned a bit from me. Uh, I think referring to the way that Turner can make light radiate from the inside of his paintings. It's true. There's nobody who can do that like Turner. Not even Rothko. But uh, I, I'm also I'm also excited to see him in the context of many of the British artists of, of that period who he knew well and and really uh, I felt I think he felt like he had a great interaction and they learned from each other. I, I think for us the move to Tate Modern was always bittersweet. Uh, they were able to create a fabulous new room there in an in a, in a institution that in some ways is quote more appropriate unquote, unquote and yet that direct connection to Turner uh, is is lost. I mean I'm very happy to travel back and forth across the Thames. I'm not sure if the typical tourist does that. Uh, so to have them back uh, next to the Turners which he always imagined and which was one of the reasons for his gift um, to the British public, to the Tate, is it's great to have that reestablished. I hope they do that every few years. It's, uh, I think, a good refresher. Indeed. The secret muses were so instrumental in my understanding of your father's work in the sense that there was the idea that they would be, he thought, in a canteen for the workers at the Four Seasons Hotel. Then it turned out that they, they were actually going to be in a high-level restaurant. And he couldn't entertain the idea that, that his works would be there for people paying those kind of prices for food. It seemed to me a, a fundamental aspect of his work that he wanted his work to be there for everybody, right? Yes, and I, I think there are ways uh, that he probably even deceived himself about what that commission was about. I think he was so excited to have a public commission to be able to control an entire space uh, and to be in a, in, a, in a public place. This is what he dreamed about for a long time. He was already painting that direction in the few years leading up to that. So I think in some level he convinced himself about just what that room would be like. But it wasn't just for a restaurant. It was actually for a private dining room at the restaurant. So... Uh, he actually fundamentally changes his style in order to address that because he realizes he's going to have people there for two or three hours. So he can't have paintings that are uh, shining at you. He needs to have them slowly seep into your system to get sort of in through your pores. And that's why he develops this darker palette. He develops these burgundies on burgundies that slowly, slowly reveal themselves. And he learns from that, and he continues borrowing from that same palette throughout his career, works that are not going to grab everyone passing by, but works that are going to pay the person back who stands a while and really has a conversation with the work. Uh, so uh, those, those works were really a turning point for him and their influence continued to resonate for him, including the very architectural aspect of them, which pays huge dividends when he goes to work a few years later on the, on the Rothko Chapel Commission in, in Houston. Um, and and the, the gloom, that gloom of the Rothko room, the, he established that he didn't want bright light, he didn't want them lit perfectly with this gleaming light, he wanted that, as, as you say, the works to reveal themselves over time in, in, in that sort of um, lower light. And there's this lovely detail in Ellen and Anne's essay in the catalogue for this show here at Pace, where she says that when exhibitions were being installed, he would actually turn the light down in the room. Can you say something about that? Uh, absolutely. My sister actually has, has real memories of him doing this at MoMA and at the Phillips uh, collection in, in uh, Washington where there's an amazing uh, room of four paintings. Uh, so he understood, again, this is back to him being so sensitive to the installation, uh, and I learned a lot from him in this regard, but posthumously, but uh, if you have the light too high, it, it bleaches out the color. I'll literally sit there with the rheostat, uh, I'll turn up the light until all of a sudden there's a little bit of a white haze that, that uh, forms on the surface of the work, and then I know to turn it down about 10% from there. They, they tell you uh, it, the color is much richer, it's much more saturated if you don't have too much light on it. And again, he did want to create, I don't know, a meditative atmosphere, but an atmosphere where you could have a quiet conversation. And too much light, it, it's, it's distracting. I think it's not an ex accent that he married my mother, a woman who walked around in sunglasses everywhere. <laughs> Neither one of them wanted to be overwhelmed by the light. They wanted it to slowly, uh, slowly envelop you. And um, talking about that slow envelopment, it, one of the things about it, you, you talked about the, the meditative quality or that sense of kind of a psychological experience that one has in front of the work. He knew that people literally had broken down in front of the work, that, that, that they were emotionally moved by his work. And that was of tremendous importance to him, wasn't it? Absolutely. Actually, he even said that he was proud that they had done that. So because it, it meant that for him that he really was communicating. You know, I think when you're making completely abstract art, and at that point it's a rather new thing, uh, you're always concerned, no matter how much good press you get and how many people slap you on the back, you're, 
say, yes, they think it's beautiful, but is it really, is it really making its point? Is it really getting under people's skin? And that told him that, uh, yes, absolutely, no question, the people are being moved. And by the way, I don't think that the crying necessarily is, is sadness. Crying means that you've been deeply touched. I'm somebody who never cries at sad things. I cry at happy things. So again, uh, when, when a painting pulls that out of you, it not only tells you the painting is working, but it also means that you've allowed yourself to open up to what it's offering. Well, Christopher, that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mark Rothko, 1968, Clearing Away, is at Pace in London until the 13th of November. The Seagram murals are at Tate Britain until January 2023. Coming up, we hear about the Gallery Climate Coalition, and our work of the week is on Nicolas Poussin. But first, I'm going to hand over to myself with a few of the top stories on our website this week. One of the great mysteries of Northern Renaissance painting, the exact nature of the contributions of Jan van Eyck and his older brother Hubert to the Ghent altarpiece in Belgium, has become a little clearer, thanks to research done by the Royal Institute of Cultural Heritage in Brussels and the University of Antwerp. After studying technical data gathered during the restoration of the lower register of the altarpiece, which includes the adoration of the lamb and side panels, the researchers have identified an underlying painting that can be attributed to Hubert van Eyck and shows important compositional differences. It was later painted over by Jan with the Fountain of Life, one of the altarpiece's most famous images. The researchers hailed the discovery as opening the door to a new chapter in the study of the Flemish primitives and the search for other paintings by Hubert van Eyck, about whom little is known. A vibrant Van Gogh watercolour of wheat stacks in a Provencal farmyard is due to be auctioned at Christie's New York on the 11th of November. The painting, which was last exhibited in 1905, is coming up for sale after complex negotiations, partly brokered by Christie's, with three contesting parties. These are the descendants of two Jewish families who owned the Van Gogh in the 1933-1945 Nazi era, and the current seller, the heirs of Edwin Cox, a Texas oilman. The watercolour was painted at the beginning of June 1888, when Van Gogh was working in Arles and was at the height of his powers. And finally, as part of our Freeze Art Fair reporting, Anna Brady writes about the growing buy one, gift one trend. Here's how it works. You're a collector who wishes to buy a piece by an in-demand artist, most likely a painter and quite probably a young one, but competition is stiff and the gallery, sniffing out the most committed collectors, insists you buy two and donate one to a museum. You may not even get to choose the work you buy, nor the museum it's donated to. You can find out more about this and read all our other Freeze Art Fair reporting on our website or the apps. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Discover the wonderful selection of works offered in Christie's modern British and Irish art auctions, part of the 20th, 21st century London season. Taking place on the 20th and 21st of October respectively, the evening and day sales showcase the breadth and diversity of 20th century British and Irish art. Led by exceptional paintings by Sir Winston Churchill, L.S. Lowry and S.J. Peplow, the sales include a strong selection of sculpture by Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth, Barry Flanagan, Elizabeth Frink and Lynn Chadwick. Further highlights include outstanding groups of works by the leading British pop artists and St Ives artists. Bringing together pictures and sculpture from across the century, both sales offer a wide range of works for all collecting tastes. Find out more at christies.com. Welcome back. Now, galleries and climate change. At the Freeze London Fair this year is a booth occupied by the Gallery Climate Coalition, or GCC. Although public museums and galleries have taken significant steps to reduce their carbon footprint and control waste, the commercial sector had until recently been lagging behind, and art fairs were the most conspicuous example. So the GCC was formed as a charity by a voluntary group of London-based gallerists and professionals working in the commercial art sector to respond meaningfully to the growing climate crisis. Louisa Buck, contemporary art correspondent at the art newspaper, has been involved with the GCC since the start, and she spoke to Heath Lowndes, who's the managing director, about the initiative. I'm here in Freeze London on the Gallery Climate Coalition stand with Heath Lowndes, the managing director of the GCC, Gallery Climate Coalition. Now, Heath, we were both in on this right from the beginning, but for our listeners, could you please just spell out what exactly is GCC, Gallery Climate Coalition? Yes, uh, GCC is an international charity and membership organisation that provides environmental sustainability guidelines for galleries, artists, institutions, non-profits and art sector businesses. 
So it's guidelines, but it's also actions what we're after, isn't it? I mean, if you join the GCC, you commit to reducing your carbon emissions by at least 50% by 2030 in line with the Paris Accord. And galleries and organisations and individuals have got to actually produce tangible evidence they're doing that. Yeah, absolutely. That's our primary target. And everything on our website helps our members in order to reach that target and go beyond. Our most important tool is a carbon calculator, which we encourage members to use at least once a year and to collect their data and submit their carbon reports. And that's a really important first step. Once a member has their uh, results for ideally a pre-COVID baseline year of 2019, they can then set their reduction targets and implement changes on the path to that 2030 50% reduction. So we have this carbon calculator, which is pretty straightforward to use. A bit like doing your accounts every year. We're hoping galleries are going to put in their flights, their travel, their building heat, etc., etc. And we're also encouraging them, and we've actually got a screen here, showing what people do use. We're asking galleries to be transparent about their carbon output and hopefully transparent about reducing it every year. Absolutely. It's a hugely important part of the initiative for uh, galleries to publish their results. It really is hanging out their dirty laundry, but it, it encourages collegiality. And for us, it's such an important step in showing that we are working together. It's all about collaboration. We, we can't do this alone. And by galleries coming together and putting aside you know, uh, market rivalries and having a public show of solidarity, it's, it's all about collaboration. And about sharing information and sharing resources too. I mean, on the website, there are all these different volunteer groups, there are these different um, research groups about packaging, travel, shipping. So all the time this information is being updated. So people really have no excuse not to do the most kind of due diligence with every aspect of their practice. Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, our resources and tools are available for free. So there's no excuse. We, we did that deliberately because some um, environmental and consultancy charge a lot of money and that's prohibitive to members so there's no excuse not to start paying attention and implementing the changes as, as we suggest and as you say we've got um, teams popping up everywhere we've been really really impressed by um, how the art sectors come together to volunteer for GCC and we have uh, research groups dedicated to our main uh, resource guidelines of shipping energy travel packaging and materials and more and um, galleries from all around the world have been working together on teams to produce that resource, which is then verified by our environmental advisors and published on our website. We also have teams in Berlin and Los Angeles and more on the way, as well as London. So it really is an international initiative now. So GCC has been around for a year now. We've got over 500 members. It's expanded into this organisation, full-time staff members. But it all began, didn't it, as pre-COVID, as one day seminar symposium where the art world was going to scratch its heads and wonder what to do. It's been quite a journey. It really has. Yeah, initially we were just going to have a one day event and there was no coalition at that point. We were just trying to bring uh, key members of the, the London art community together to talk about the issues we faced and maybe find some possible solutions. But obviously COVID uh, made that event not possible anymore. And we reformulated at the beginning of lockdown. I think we, we thought we'd lost the momentum because we were really um, getting a lot of people interested. And then COVID happened and we thought we'd lost it. But in fact, the opposite happened. And suddenly people had availability to give to this initiative. And there was some sort of linked understanding that our impact on the planet, we were out of balance with nature. And somehow COVID linked to that and people felt like they had more time and interest and, and capacity to give to an initiative like this. So if anything, we grew because of COVID. And yeah, we, we changed our tact. Rather than just starting the conversation, we became an organisation that was providing the solutions. I mean, I remember those weekly meetings through lockdown. They were actually rather therapeutic. That was, you know, us, galleries, Thomas Dane, Kate McGarry, Greg Hilty of Listen, uh, Sadie Coles was involved also, Matthew Slotover, Victoria Siddle, you know, Freeze. I mean, but it was a very small group and now it's expanded to this, you know, international organisation. But... Also, it's become a charity and our funding is a whole other issue. Could you talk a little bit about how GCC actually runs itself and how it finances itself? Primarily, we're funded by a supporter circle, which are the uh, largest um, galleries, auction houses, uh, collectors in the sector. And they are either a donor, patron or a supporter, giving it different levels. And we think it's really important that the um, coalition is 
funded by those individuals because as the biggest earners they're also the biggest polluters and they're taking responsibility and helping subsidize the cost of um, the advice for other galleries who maybe can't afford it so much. So uh, we also uh, have voluntary donations from anyone but it's free to sign up. We, we, we do encourage voluntary donations at the point of membership registration but it's, it's not mandatory. So we kicked off in London during lockdown, but very quickly it became evident there was a real kind of international impetus to this. I mean, there's as much activity now, it seems, going on internationally, in America, across Europe, as, as there was in London. Can you just outline a little bit about how that's expanded? So after London launched uh, at the end of October last year, quite quickly we were um, contacted by Jennifer Chert from Chert Lud in Berlin, who suggested that they start a group in Berlin, which is really exciting for us. We hadn't initially thought that that would be a possibility, but once they offered, we were really enthusiastically embraced that. And so she brought together a team of enthusiastic individuals in Berlin who were ready to put the time in to do the research and produce content of their own. And from there, uh, a group emerged from, from L.A., led by Haley Mellon from Art to Acres, the artist and conservationist, as well as Klaus Biesenbach from, from MoCA, who led the charge and really inspired the community there to come together. And so we've launched those two groups, and we've got a few more on the way. Keeping the information really specific, too. So it's like, where can people share equipment? What are the best kind of recycling facilities? Keeping it granular and local, but also really overarching and international as well. Yeah, and we've been really impressed with the level of uh, detail that our groups have gone into. So everything from um, plinth sharing schemes, um, storage facilities, questioning how uh, artworks are shipped in the local um, vicinity. All of this has just been so great to see. And there's people who have changed their behaviour as a result of these organisations. Well, I want to talk a bit more about that. I mean, there's a lot of wonderful talk. This booth looks terrific. But what actually are galleries doing? I mean, publishing what your carbon output is good and all fair and wise but you know what are people actually doing are we seeing a real shift in behavior i know that kate mcgarry gallery for example are now only doing art fairs that she can get to by train and the artworks can get to by by road other other galleries are saying they're going to do fewer big international fairs i mean everyone we're not telling people what to do are we we're just telling people various different ways that can reduce the carbon footprint and then leave galleries or individuals up to them to how how they actually implement that yeah we can only encourage people we can give the guidelines give the instructions outline how it's going to reduce emissions people have to take action themselves we'll shortly be releasing a decarbonisation action plan which is a sector specific roadmap for exactly how our members and others can reach that target not only 50% but also 70% target and we'll be um, announcing that at a dedicated conference later in, in November and also on this booth we've got an absolutely glorious Wolfgang Tillman's work which is being given by him and Maureen Paley Gallery for the GCC. Could we talk a little bit about this? I mean, this is up for somebody to buy, then to give the funds to the GCC for our running costs? Yes, we're hugely grateful to Wolfgang and Maureen Paley Gallery for donating this artwork. It's a beautiful piece, and thematically it's perfect for the booth and for our cause. It shows a tree that was uh, snapped after a freak hurricane in Germany a few years ago, and it's just perfectly shows uh, the environmental damage that is becoming all too common nowadays. So here we are with the boo that frees, um, with the wonderful Wolfgang Tillmans here, the monitor showing so many carbon measurements already being taken, info about GCC. What do you really want this to achieve this week? I mean, we've also got guest organisations where art meets the environment coming on here and having sort of hosted slots as well, haven't we? So it's a whole multifarious thing going on. It's a fantastic opportunity not only to speak to the art sector and people in the community, but also to share the platform with other like-minded organisations working at the intersection of culture and sustainability. Culture Declares is one of them, isn't it? Yeah, Julie's Bicycle, Culture Declares, um, Invisible Dust. These are all amazing initiatives that have been working before we came along and we're using this opportunity to, to partner with them and to give them a platform as well. And one of the um, guests we have on the booth as well is... Client Earth, who are an incredible organization, an environmental charity and a legal firm who take um, governments and big businesses to court and sue them for their environmental damages and the impacts that they have. And they're an uh, organization that we've partnered with along with Christie's uh, for an auction series which launches on Friday. 
first piece we have is Cecily Brown, a beautiful painting, and that'll be the first in a series, and we're aiming to raise over £5 million for them over the course of the year. And significantly, the Cecily Brown is already here. It's not being shipped, is it? We're, we're, we're trying where possible to save on the shipping, you know, live by our own rules, and make sure the works are, are where, they, where they're being sold. That's an important part of the series. So the sales will take place in New York, Hong Kong, London, across the world, with the works already existing in those territories and hoping to find a, a local buyer so the artworks don't have to travel around the world. So we're raising the money for Client Earth, we're hosting other organisations. It is really a sense of the fact we're all uniting, trying trying to reduce the environmental impact and trying to lessen our horrible, wasteful, polluting behaviour in our sector. But also there's a positive note, isn't there? I mean, there have been talks about a more kind of proactive way of being more environmentally sustainable. What's it? Thriveability? It's called this new idea about actually making artworks and making initiatives within our sector that don't just limit damage, but actually proactively make things more positive. Yeah, we haven't quite overcome the hurdle of people's attitude of being able to sustain businesses whilst also reduce emissions. But we're confident that our members can reduce by a minimum of 50% and still maintain healthy businesses. I think the next point is to go on and illustrate ways that people can thrive and not just survive with those reductions. And there's lots of exciting possibilities that we will explore. analog presence for GCC and let's hope the art world is signing up so we have many more than 550 members by the end of this week. Thank you very much Heath. Thank you. The GCC booth is at Freeze London which like its sibling Freeze Masters continues until Sunday the 17th of October. You can read more about the GCC at galleryclimatecoalition.org and the first edition of our Freeze Daily newspapers made at the fair this week was entirely dedicated to green issues and included, among much else, an opinion piece by Brian Eno. You can find that and other climate change reporting on the website and the apps. And finally, it's time for our work of the week. The exhibition Poussin and the Dance opened last week at the National Gallery in London and travels next year to the Getty Centre in Los Angeles. It looks at the 17th century French artist's paintings and drawings of dancing figures alongside the antique sculpture he studied in Rome, allowing us to follow his journey from absorbing the ancient world to its transformation in paint on canvas. The show includes the rare loan of a 2nd century CE relief of five dancers before a portico, known as the Borghese Dancers, and seen by Poussin at the Villa Borghese in Rome and now in the Louvre in Paris. I spoke to the exhibition's curator, Francesca Whitlam-Cooper, about the work and Poussin's response to it, particularly in the painting A Bacchanalian Revel Before a Term in the National Gallery's collection. Francesca, Poussin's love affair with Rome was hampered somewhat by trying just to get there in the first place, wasn't it? It absolutely was. This is someone who tried three times to get to Rome, third time lucky in the case of Poussin. He uh, gets as far as Florence on one trip, as far as Lyon. I think, you know, we don't think anything now about travel, but actually in the 17th century, the means you would have had, the time it would have taken. I can't imagine how heartbroken he must have been to get as far as Florence, but he made it in the end. But then when he got there, the, the depth of his engagement with the classical world, classical statuary and the bas relief that we're standing in front of was extraordinary, wasn't it? Because he was measuring in, in immaculate detail the sculptures and everything. He was, and I think... You know, it's, it's, we have to strike a balance because obviously it's not, it's not unique for painters to be interested in sculpture. People were going to Rome because it's basically the closest you can get to the classical world. It's the seat of the Renaissance. Of course, artists who painted took an interest in sculpture, but it seems that Poussin went a lot further with that. So he's out, as you said, with a tape measure, measuring you know, the distance between a wrist and an elbow on a classical sculpture. How high is the instep? How deep is the clavicle? You know, how can I take these very, very, very precise measurements and, and learn some kind of secret formula um, for, for my own art? And that, that seems pretty unusual. Indeed it does. Um, now, we're standing in front of the Borghese dancers. Tell me about the significance of this to Poussin. So this is one of Poussin's most beloved antiquities. It's um, this beautiful frieze of five dancing women sort of tripping across this piece of marble for all the world as if they don't weigh anything. When, of course, we know it's this incredibly heavy piece of stone. They've got these fabulous fluttering draperies, they linked hands. And this is, um, this is one of the antiquities that is name-checked by Poussin's 17th century biographers. It's a work that we know that he studied, and that's not only from 
descriptions of people telling us that, but actually because we can trace this kind of interest in linked hands and dancing figures directly in his works. Are there any sketches that exist still that we can see? Would he have sketched directly in front of it? He would. I think he would have sketched directly in front of it. We know that he also was modelling, so um, we have descriptions of him at the Villa Ludovisi looking at a Titian and actually taking something two-dimensional and then modelling it in three dimensions, so I don't think it's at all unrealistic to think that he might have been modelling these dancers as well. Those don't survive. I mean, none of his wax figurines survive. That's why we've recreated them for the show, because in the 17th century they wouldn't have had any value. There's no, there's no sketches of Poussin you know, sat in front of this that we know of, but um, certainly a couple of drawings and, and several paintings in which we can see that influence. Indeed. Before we talk about specifically how Poussin used mm. it in his own art, tell me about the kind of journey that this relief went on, because firstly there was the cast that were made from it, but then also it is now in the Louvre. So tell, you know, how has it entered into French culture, if you like? Absolutely. So this was at the Villa Borghese in Poussin's life time it has a pendant which is known as the Borghese marriage they were installed actually above doors so for me I have this image of Poussin either sat on the floor in front of this doorway or maybe even up on a ladder kind of sticking his (laughs) nose into this it gets to the Louvre through you know around the Napoleonic period so it's something that is a gifted by the Borghese family to one of Napoleon's relatives and that's how it enters the Louvre as with so many objects um, in the early 19th century But yeah, it has this other life in in France as well, because actually in Poussin's lifetime, it it doesn't seem like it will ever leave Rome. And he um, advises that there are certain antiquities, certain reliefs that are so important, they need to have casts made of them for the French royal collection. It is inconceivable to him that the French royal collection cannot have a version of something so iconic and important as this. So we've been very, very lucky because we've been able to borrow the bronze cast from the Wallace collection, which was made for the collection of Louis XIII. Um, And we've been able to put the two together, which is really, really special because I don't think that would ever have happened because I think the bronze leaves the French royal collection before the marble arrives, as it were. So it's it's really nice to have the two together. And and in fact, this relief is is pretty much as Poussin saw it because there were modern additions in his own era, right? Yes, absolutely. So if you come and look closely at this, you can see that several of the heads and particularly the faces have been repaired, some of the limbs as well. Um, If you're you're into looking very closely, the, the dancer on the far left, her head and face actually are original they haven't been touched so you can get a sense of how it would have looked those repairs though it's important to know are largely from a campaign that happened in about 1617 so this is what Poussin knew what Poussin saw it's not like we're looking at a kind of 20th century refurbishment that's completely different from what Poussin studied this is with a few a few tweaks in the 1770s this is what Poussin saw and of course the 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 cast that was made of it they added bits and most importantly the feet they did, they did. So um, my understanding is that as the cast was shipped from Rome to Paris, and, and it wasn't a bronze cast at that point, it would have been um, wax or plaster, you know, a sort of model for somebody to work from, it got a bit dinged up. And so once they start trying to work on it, they've got sketches and they've got, you know, the, this thing that's arrived from Rome, but they, they sort of have to fill in a few gaps. So you can, you, know, you can play quite a fun game of spot the difference. You'll notice that the dancers are holding bouquets of flowers the whole run of feet is there we've got these beautiful sandaled feet you know peeking off the off the edge of the the cast and stuff which um yeah this is just a, a fun bit of the story exactly let's go and look at, at what Poussin did Absolutely. with the information one of the questions I've always had is why didn't Poussin just be a sculptor why did he need to paint for me the the interest in dimensionality and and these antique works and everything else it I do think it always comes through the prism of being a painter and being someone who is who, who is a graphic artist, if that makes sense. So I think all the dimensionality and the exploration, I think those do remain tools to achieve something that other people, to his mind, hadn't achieved in painting, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're standing in front of a Bacchanalian revel, which is one of the works which would clearly show how he looked at that relief and absorbed it and translated it and transformed it to a certain degree. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got this, um, we're in a lovely sunlit Arcadian glade. It's a boozy afternoon. We've got this you know, chain of dancers holding hands and weaving in amongst each other. And I think, you know, you're exactly right. He's clearly, I think the, the idea of the dance subject certainly comes to him from all these 
um, objects, these antiquities from the classical world. It's something that we see over and over again in antiquities, whether they're vases and urns or the relief sculptures. To me, what's really interesting here is how much the painting itself starts taking on the qualities of the frieze, that this is, we're in this landscape, we can see these beautiful smoky hills in the distance and the green fields, but all the action is so compressed. It really happens in one plane, in a sort of line in front of us. Um, you know, so I think it's not only that he's inspired by the motif of dancers, I think he's actually in some ways trying to emulate that freeze-like arrangement in space as well. But also, because he's working in two dimensions, because the plane is inevitably that much more imaginative, mm. he can do things a sculptor can't. He absolutely can, and, and this is someone who's completely unencumbered by the practicalities of sculpture, because if you think about, like we were saying, the weight of the marble, you have to always be thinking about support. How can I, you know, the Borghese dancers, they can't, tumble like this they can't leap off the, you know the surface whereas Poussin in some ways he's freed from that in paint because you know he can he can balance he can capture whichever moment of balance and tumble he likes one of the great things I love looking at with Poussin are the details mm. and, and can we just concentrate on that wonderful moment where one of the dancers is squeezing grapes yes. into a bowl and it's so exquisitely painted as you say with this wonderful misty mountains in the distance yes. tell us tell us about about that well i guess you know Poussin's attention to detail these extraordinary details Poussin's attention to detail is uh, phenomenal. So I love that on the left-hand side of the painting and these little putties like reaching their bowl up as if they want to get drunk. But then if you look to the right-hand side, there's actually another little putty who's climbed up and is just drinking wine straight from this kind of fantastic urn over here without anybody noticing. Does that mean that the, the sort of putty that's lying on the ground face down over there is drunk? Okay. He's absolutely, I, to me, I think he's absolutely had too much. There's always somebody lying on the floor in a Poussin who's had way too much. Poussin of this period, I should say. But no, the attention to detail for me, you know, it's also you gosh look at these feet look at you know the intersection of you know a toe almost touching a leg or her toe almost touching the buttock of the the sleeping putto there on the floor you know it's it's so carefully planned I think precisely to give you the enjoyment of that moment and we can't talk about Poussin without talking about colour, the colour that so many <laughs> artists have revered over time. Yes. Well, you know, I think that's one of the, that's one of the things that's so, that's so funny to me, because I think, and this is why people need to come to the exhibition, but I think you walk into this show and Poussin feels really colourful and really bright. And people have talked about that, but equally, you know, after his death and, and you know, for quite a long time that follows, the French Academy ties itself in knots about you know, colour versus line and, and Poussin is seen as line and Rubens with his amazing free brushstroke and all the looseness of that, he's the proponent of colour. I think actually it is time we start thinking about colour and Poussin as well. It's that harmony, isn't it? There's a sort of evenness of tone mm. to a degree, but an incredible sense of harmony that what we're seeing is this tremendous activity and energy and everything else, but, but a kind of unbelievable calm and, and, and poise about everything that we're witnessing. Absolutely, and I think the colours are really, really carefully distributed. I think you see that here because you've got this amazing gold and yellow almost in the centre of the picture. You've got the blue balanced on both sides, the white or the cream balanced on both sides, the reddish tones of the, the, some of the dance and the, the satyr, you know, it, it, it is all really meticulously planned out. If you look at the adoration of the golden calf, where you've got this kind of swelling crowd scene, again, you know, the colours are just distributed to, to kind of give you that effect of, of, of a crowd surging upwards in movement. So it's definitely something he's, he's thinking about very carefully, I think. Well, what a pleasure to talk about Poussin. Francesca, thank you so much. Thank you. Poussin and the Dance is at the National Gallery in London until the 2nd of January 2022 and at the J. Paul Getty Museum at the Getty Centre in Los Angeles from 15th of April to the 8th of May next year. And that's all for this episode. Do subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With, and please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julie Mahouska, Amy Dawson and David Clack, and David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Henrietta Bentel and Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Louisa and Heath, Christopher and Francesca. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.